Good evening and welcome to Monday Night Bible Study. Hope you guys are doing well uh, as we continue to take a look at uh, Acts chapter 16. Uh, God's got great stuff with us, uh, for us, and I ask that um, you just bow your heads as we pray and, and we'll go from there. Dear, I thank you so much for the opportunity that we have to be yours. Um, we thank you for your faithfulness and how you continue to walk beside us. We thank you for wisdom, dear Lord, and how you desire for us to know. And we ask that you would help us, that you might open uh, the eyes of our heart and the, and the eyes of our mind, that we might be able to see your truth clearly today. Um, thank you for your goodness and, um, and for the way that you call to us and, and you arrange for situations that, that we can't uh, imagine or understand otherwise. Thank you, God. In your name we pray. Amen. Um, to pick up where we were, uh, we are on uh, Paul's second missionary journey. Um, he, uh, last week, <clears throat> if you remember, he, um, he had left. He's with Silas. Uh, he just picked up Timothy as well. And Luke is there as, as the kind of autobiographer or, or biographer, I guess, at that point. And um, so they're journeying and uh, they left Barnabas and John Mark who went over towards uh, Cyprus and uh, end up towards Crete. And um, here they are. Uh, they tried last week to try to go into Asia Minor, and God just uh, closed that. They tried to go further in, and God said no. As they continued to pray, God opened the door, had someone in Macedonia calling, saying, come to us. And Paul's like, okay, that's what we're doing. And, and the verse is very interesting. It just says they packed up and they left, and uh, which is exciting to think how quickly they were willing to, um, to go and, and respond to God's call. Uh, it says, in fact, verse 10, it says, when Paul had seen the vision, immediately we sought to go on to Macedonia, concluding that God had called us to preach the gospel to them. Um, so there's this immediate urgency of, if this is what God has, that's what we want to be part of, and uh, which is exciting and refreshing and something that we need to be able to embrace as well. Um, and so we're going to pick up in verse 10 uh, of how they're setting forth and saying, okay, now what do you got next, God? Uh, so verse 11 here. Um, so setting uh, so setting sail from Troas, we made a direct voyage to uh, Samothrace and the following day to Neapolis, and from there to Philippi, which is a leading city of the district of Macedonia and a Roman colony. Um, we remained in the city for some days, and on the Sabbath day, we went outside uh, to the gate at the riverside where we supposed that there was a pro where we supposed there was a place of prayer, and we sat down and spoke to the woman who had come. Uh, together. Well, the one who heard us was a woman named Lydia from the city of Thyatira, a seller of purple goods, who was a worshiper of God. The Lord opened her heart to pay attention to what was said by Paul. Uh, after, and after she was baptized, uh, and her whole household as well, she urged us, saying, If you have judged me to be faithful to the Lord, come to my house and stay. And she prevailed upon us. Um, we're going to stop right there, um, just an understanding of, of what the city is and, and where we are. Um, <clears throat> things that I, I think are important for us to know, as I move my notes over here. Um, it, it used to be called uh, Crenides. Uh, it was called the Springs, and that's geographically what it was. Uh, it's just kind of a bottom of the hill kind of place. Uh, Greece is um, Macedonia, that part is very mountainous. In, in fact, over 70% of Greece is mountains, and so um, it, it is mountainous, and uh, it, it was renamed for Alexander the Great's dad, uh, King Philip, um, who established a city to prevent people from stealing the gold that was discovered there, uh, right in, in those mountains. Now, the gold by this time had, had been expired, and, and so they were no longer gold seekers, but uh, it was still a very important city. Um, Roman, Rome had ruled this area, uh, Philippi for about 200 years at this point when when, when they're there and um, so it had been long established uh, in 42 AD this is where uh, Mark Antony and this is after Julius Caesar was stabbed um, and uh, two of the people including Brutus and, and Cassius Cassius was the money guy uh, they actually fled there and this is where the big battle happened uh, between Mark Antony and Octavian uh, who would end up taking over the throne as, as Augustus and um, Brutus and, and Cassius. That was here, and uh, which which comes into play a little bit later uh, of its significance, especially. But this is a well known spot. Um, in fact, the, the historians say there's at this point in time probably just over 500 
former soldiers that were Roman that lived in Philippi. Um, Rome had this interesting way of, uh, so you had Italy and these soldiers that fought were all granted land and granted privilege, but there wasn't enough in Italy to go around. And so they ended up getting uh, their, their land and their tax-free living and stuff elsewhere in these colonies that were set up by Rome and established for these old soldiers to go and live. And this was one of those. And, and so these soldiers that are living there, I mean, they're enjoying, they would still dress like the Roman. They would still talk in, in Latin. Um, you know, they would still, it was still their culture. They also enjoy the same, same privileges uh, as citizens that, that others. In fact, it kind of became in, in these kind of colonies, this place of there's the citizens and then there's everyone else. They sometimes called the strangers. I don't want to say it's kind of like the Amish where you have the us and them, um, but but that's that's kind of how it was. And so um, there's definitely this entitlement of we are Romans and the rest of you, I mean, you live here, but that's just kind of what it is. And so the large population of, of, of ex-military who are living their retirement life in this, this place, um, there's other benefits you have of being self-governing. Uh, was one of them. Um, they were free of taxes. They celebrated all the Roman holidays and um, they used Roman coins and things like that was their system. They had a magistrate that was there that was Roman to take care of the Roman issues. And, uh, and they had the other stuff there too, but, but where they found their identity was in, in, in Rome. Um, the, uh, the citizens uh, also had some privileges that, that are going to come into play here very quickly as well with when it comes to the law and who's under what law. Um, there's the local law and then there's the Roman law. Uh, the Romans, as citizens, you, you couldn't scourge them. Uh, you had to have a trial. Uh, they, they could appeal to the magistrate. They could appeal to Caesar. Things that the others, the, the common folk, could not do. And so there was definitely this great dichotomy between those two groups in this place. And that's so important for us to understand the historical significance of, of what we're looking at um, when we're studying the Bible. And uh, so I wanted to spend a couple of minutes uh, of this. Um, now, that being said, uh, they meet Lydia down at the river. Uh, notice that the Jewish presence here is so small, they can't even afford a synagogue. Now, in order to have a synagogue, you need at least 10. Um, they didn't have that. And notice who we talked to. It says the women who were there. And so there were some women that, that, that were there. Uh, the city that they mentioned, um, uh, Th where'd it go? Thyra, Thyra. Um, that is over in Asia Minor, and that city was known, famous everywhere, uh, for the dying of purple. The Phoenicians also uh, ha had a, had an outpost there, and and had um, were known for their sea travels and whatnot. And that's kind of who started it. And and the dying of purple was absolutely fascinating. Um, the people that were there that were purple dyers had great honor and respect. Uh, they, they found archaeological evidence that has you know, big pieces of marble to say, you know, the, in, in Latin, the, the purple dyers have, have supplied for this to be here and, and, and they are held in great esteem and all these things that you would carve and put on your doors that I would not carve and put on my doors. Uh, but that's kind of who they were and, and they were well respected there. Um, the process itself, um, is interesting. Um, you you take these these sh sh shellfish, um, these marine snails called Bolinus baradiris, and um, you have to. <laughs> this is pretty yucky. You collect several thousand of them, and then you would boil them for days in these giant lead vats. They just boil and boil and boil. And the breaking down of the of the shells and stuff, and the breaking down uh, by the sun, the sunlight, and it causes this this dye that that literally was worth its weight in gold so um one of the historians that, that talked about it says you know uh back in you know 200 years ago uh yeah about 200 years ago 150 said you know that um the, it, it's if you were to take you know and, and dye just a pound of wool it was worth you know so many hundred pounds of of, of you know money back then in english pounds and uh and and so it's just it's worth a lot and so they were held with right esteem, a high esteem, and and they would have had she would have had a big house. So when she invites them to stay with her, like she has room. The fact that there's no husband mentioned um, really alludes to the fact that she's a widow, 
but she's still able to do her trade because of the Greek connection, because of the skill that she has, and because of the prominence that she would have obtained there. Um, in Roman culture, women were of, of, of noble status and of richer status, were able to do things that normal women were not allowed to do. And so, so that's where she is in, in the mix of this. Um, I do, uh, interesting enough, um, the practice of, of purple dyeing using these snails actually continued until 1856. <laughs> that, it blew my mind when I read that. I um, think that that's 100, 160 years ago. Like, that's not that long ago when people were still doing this. Um, or 180, whatever it is. And, and so you look and say, like, how... That's crazy. And, and the way that they actually developed, the first developer of, of synthetic dye... Uh, was a guy named William Perkins. He was 18 years old. He um, he was trying to synthesize uh, quinine, quinine and uh, in the lab, and he made a mess. He was trying to clean up the stuff that he had made with some alcohol, and as he did it, it turned purple. And it was the, literally the first synthetic dye that we have is because of this. And uh, <laughs> the article I was reading said it saved it saved thousands of snails' lives now because of this uh, this development, which I thought was interesting, but. This was uh, a honed skill. It was of great value, and, and that's where Lydia was. And she opens their home. You know, Romans 12, 13 talks about giving hospitality, as, as Paul says there, and, and the importance of Christians to be able to, set, to open their homes to people. First um, Peter 4, 9 also says, practice, practice hospitality ungrudgingly towards one another. And so it's interesting how Lydia is willing to say, hey, look, you know, um, I was just baptized, you know, and, and my family, we don't know who was in her family. Um, incidentally, uh, these, this passage here in chapter 16 is, is one of the reference points for people uh, such as Presbyterians uh, or, or some other denominations that practice uh, infant baptism. Lutherans, as they say, you know, the whole house was baptized. Uh, later in the chapter, the jailer's whole family is going to be baptized. And, and so uh, that is, a, in my mind, a little bit of a leap saying that you knew they had babies, you knew that they had kids, at, w at what age? And we don't know that. Um, but that is kind of, this is the reference point that, uh, the only reference points to um, to the possibility of kids being baptized. Um, but but she is baptized in her family, whoever that entails. And uh, and they say, come back and, and live here. And, and so they do. Uh, they, they stay with them. I, I, before we rush on, though, I want to point out back in... Um, uh, back a little farther up here, it mentions that um, he went down to the river and met the women. And I love that Paul, uh, before I go farther, I want to make sure, I, I love that Paul continued to look for ways to connect with people. And he started with the Jews, even though his ministry is to the Gentiles, he started with the Jews and said, I've got to go to God's own first. And, um, and I think it's important for us, uh, even today, as we look at uh, at the ministry that we do, are, are we starting with people that have that have known the truth, or are we just start and say, I, I'm just going to give up on all those people that that used to come to church, I'm going to give up on all those people that that grew up in the church, I'm going to give up on them because they've had their chance, and I'm just moving on, or do we like Paul and say, Hey, I'm going to continue to go to them and just hope that God changes hearts and changes lives. And, and if that doesn't happen, I'm still going to go, I'm still going to witness, and, and I'm still going to be other places, but I'm going to start there with people that have a knowledge of the background of God. And so I think that was interesting. And I think that might be a good example for us to follow is how can we um, be the people that God's called us to and how can we minister to the people? Because God has a desire for God to love the world that he gave his only son. How can we continue to be ministering in in, in such a way? Um, so that's in verse, uh, so we just finished this, this first part. We move on to the second part of the lesson, which is when they end up in prison. Uh, verse 16, as we were going to the place of prayer, uh, the river, <clears throat> we met a slave. We were met by a slave girl who had a spirit of divination and brought her owners much gain by fortune telling. She followed Paul and, and us and crying out, these men are the servants of the Most High God who proclaim to you the way of salvation. And she kept doing this for many days. Paul, having been greatly annoyed, <laughs> turned and said to the spirit, I command you in the name of, the, of Jesus Christ to come out of her. And it came out of her that very hour. I'm just going to pause for a sec. Uh, so this is a, a demon casting out due to annoyance. <laughs> he just, I'm just sick of this. 
I'm casting this demon out now, and they're just going to have an end to that because I'm annoyed. Um, it's interesting, though. It is interesting. Why didn't Paul cast the demon out sooner? Um, why did he wait until he's annoyed to do so? Uh, is it because God's timing wasn't right? Because God was still building up the church, building up the church, building up the, the, the community of believers there until he's going to, because he's going to end up in jail. That's the next couple of verses here. Uh, and then he's going to leave town. Um, is, is God just saying, well, just wait, wait, wait. Okay. Now is the point where I need you this to happen. And because I, I've needed for this to grow to the point that, that I can pull you out now and it can still survive here. Um, God's timing is a crazy thing is what I'm getting at. And, and it's hard for us sometimes in our own wisdom to say, this is how God should do it when we don't see the whole picture. Um, Isaiah 55 is talking about salvation. And, and he says, you know, for my ways are not your ways, neither are my thoughts your thoughts, declares the Lord. And there's times that, that our salvation and, and the way that we think things should be done is not the way that God does it or, um, you know, planned on doing it. So I think it's important for us just to note that, you know, it is done by annoyance, but but God's timing is perfect, and and we can trust Him that that He will He will push us as to when we need to do what we need to do. Um, verse nineteen. Then, but when her owners saw that their hope uh, of gain was gone, they seized Paul and Silas and dragged them into the marketplace before the rulers. And when they had brought them to the magistrate, they said, "These men are Jews and are disturbing our cities. They advocate customs that are not lawful for us as Romans to accept or practice." The crowd joined in attacking them, and the magistrates tore the garments off of them and gave orders to be to beat them with rods. When they had inflicted many blows on them, they threw them in prison and ordered the jailer to keep them safely. <laughs> safely. Having received this order, he put them in an inner prison and fastened their feet in stocks. So this is where they are. They're, they're stuck in jail, and they've been beaten. They've been stripped of their clothes. Uh, it is not a good situation. It's that point where a lot of us kind of feel discouraged. Like we feel like we've been beaten up for our faith. God we're serving you and what is happening here like come on god like where are you and that's a frustrating thing whenever we struggle with with trusting that that this is where we're supposed to be and, and it's so easy for us to get discouraged so easy for us to to, to be in despair and yet god is not done with the situation and praise god that he isn't done with us either praise god that we can continue to trust him and say god um what do, what do you got next here i, I don't <laughs> i don't necessarily like where this is but what are you going to do? Remember Matthew 5, it says, you know, blessed are you when you are persecuted uh, for my sake, for great is your reward in heaven. So it, it's it's not a, you know, if you're persecuted, it's when you're persecuted. And so you think about, okay, God, how are you working this for for our good and your glory, though? Because your glory is much more important than our good. Um, and so there they are. Uh, they're in the inner prison and, and they're locked up tight. Um, about midnight, verse 25, Paul and Silas were praying and singing hymns to God, and the prisoners were listening to them. It's amazing how sometimes when we're in bad spots, our witness shines even more. And the people that are also in bad spots might see that. And God, it's a surprise, really, that God orchestrated for this to happen? I don't think at all. I, I think that those other prisoners would not have necessarily known why they were there. I mean, maybe someone told them, but... Um, but here they are saying like, okay, these guys got beaten. They got stripped. They're in the inner part of the jail, like for the bad, bad guys. And who is this God they're singing to? What gives them this joy? What gives them this hope? I know some of us, uh, go through some rough times and we say, okay, God, where are you? And where's the hope that I need? And, and, and sometimes this slipper is, it's like a greased pig. And you say, man, or <laughs> a small child all soaked up in the bathtub. And you say, man, I cannot hold on to this. And yet God says, I have good stuff for you. Um, so they're singing and praising God. And, and suddenly there was a great earthquake, verse 26, that the foundations of the prison were shaken. Um, and immediately all the doors were opened. And I'll, I'll pause there just for a sec. It does sit along fault lines. There, there would be potential for, I mean, Pompeii is not that far away. Um, and uh, there is, it, it is a fault line. Uh, so earthquakes would have been something that they would have actually, as Greeks, seen as um, the Greek part would have seen as like, this is something from the gods, potentially. Um, the, the Romans would have been like, this is really annoying because it's an earthquake. Uh, what's going on here? Because they were still superstitious as well. Um, but, but it is something that could have happened naturally. Now, we know as believers 
that God orchestrates this because this is what's going to cause salvation and bring salvation and, and how God uses even crazy things like that. Uh, all the doors uh, were opened and everyone's bonds unfastened. Now, this is the part where we know that it's something more than just the natural world having an earthquake. The chains came off. Earthquakes don't, don't do chains. Earthquakes can maybe knock the doors off, but not the chains. And so this is the point where they say, uh-oh, what's going to happen? When the jailer woke, he saw the prison doors were open. He drew his sword and was about to kill himself, supposing the prisoners had escaped. Now I'm going to pause here for a sec because it's important for us to understand the context of what the jailer would have been thinking, potentially. Um, remember back in Acts chapter 12, verse 19, uh, Peter was put in prison and, and, and Herod had him there and he was really mad at him and, and he put him in prison and he had him chained on both sides in the middle of the night. An angel came and tapped him and said, hey, come on with me. And he ends up, you know, going and walking right through the gates and, every, and no one knows what's going on. Verse verse 19 of chapter 12, Herod had searched for him unsuccessfully. He examined the guards and ordered for them to be executed. And then he went down from Judea to Caesarea and spent some time there. So the consequence for guards or jailers when you lose your prisoners is death. Um, Acts 27 verse 42, remember Paul, we didn't get there yet, but Paul's going to be shipwrecked and the, and the soldiers on board are going to be like, okay, we got to kill this, got to kill these guys because I am not dying if we can just say oh we know they're dead then maybe we can save our own necks because because i don't i don't want to die for these guys and paul says no no no, just wait just wait um don't i've had the vision all of us wind up there safely you can trust me and they again they'd seen his faith in action and they're like you know what we're gonna trust this guy which is crazy that you're believing these prisoners but when when they have that when paul has that conviction of the holy spirit and is able to show that and share that with them what a tremendous thing that they were able to say is no, no, no. We we know that, that I don't know. I don't. I don't necessarily know. I don't necessarily believe all of it. But there's something about this guy. There's something about this God that is worth believing and trusting. Um. So also, uh, some historians have suggested um, both Brutus and Cassius, as they were fighting, as I mentioned earlier, they're fighting in this place. Uh, both of them committed suicide as a way. In fact, several others of the of the followers. Those are the two main guys. Several of the followers committed suicide rather than, uh, they, they, they saw that they were lost to Mark Anthony and, and to Octavius, and they said, we're going to commit suicide. And so in this area, suicide was seen as a more honorable way if, if you have lost your charge or your way was up, or I'm, I'm going to do this. Now, the Bible, we need to know that there is great hope and grace in Jesus, and that no matter what the sin, God says, I want a relationship, and I want to be able to deal with this, but but that's not where this jailer was, he didn't know about God, he didn't know about the grace, and so as he is here, about to kill himself, thinking the, the things have escaped, verse 28 says, uh, but Paul cried out in the loud, loud voice, do not harm yourself, we're all here, and the jailer called for the lights, and rushed in, and trembling with fear, he fell down before Paul and Silas, and then he brought them out, and said, sirs, what must I do to be saved? And they said, believe in the Lord Jesus Christ and you'll be saved, you and your household. And they spoke the word of the Lord to him and all those who were in his house. And he took them the same hour in the night and washed up their wounds. And he was baptized at once, he and all his family. And then he brought them up to his house and set food before them. And he rejoiced with them. And the entire house had believed in God. <clears throat> we'll pause there for a sec. It, it, it's crazy because here they are, this opportunity to... To run away and they don't the soldiers don't run i mean sorry the, the prisoners don't run away and um and paul says don't worry about it uh, we're all still here crazy the witness crazy how god convicted crazy how god works his situation and uh and it's it's interesting because um he ends up coming to know he says in, in the verse that we know uh believe in the lord jesus christ and you'll be saved and and so there's this this opportunity we have for this great passage just to end with this uh, almost end with it you know hey you just got to believe you just got to believe and and but what follows that belief is i want to publicly say that i'm with with this jesus guy so all this is happening in the middle of the night talk about a crazy night they did not get any sleep that night uh and so here they are um they eat they get cleaned up and um and they're rejoicing because they're going to be part of this church that's going to be just just going to be flourishing there in uh, Philippi. Yeah, Lydia's there. Uh, she has some influence and money. You have the jailer who is not of the same social class at all that is there. 
and and I bet you're gonna have some of those other people that have witnessed this stuff saying, "Man, I don't even know, but I I want to know what in the world's going on here." Um, it was daytime, verse thirty-five. Uh, the magistrates and police said, let those men go. And the jailer reported those words to Paul. The magistrates have said, let you go. Therefore, come out now and go in peace. <laughs> but Paul said to them, they have beaten us publicly, uncondemned, men who are Roman citizens and have thrown us in prison. And do they now throw us out secretly? No, let them come and take us out themselves. The police reported these words to the magistrate and they were afraid when they heard they were Roman citizens. So they came and apologized to them. And they took them out and asked them to leave the city. So they went out of the prison, visited Lydia, and when they had seen uh, seen the brothers, they encouraged them and departed. Now, I love that they'd seen the brothers. I don't know if the Philippian jailer was one of those, or there's other guys that had joined this in the several days or weeks that, that Paul and, and Silas and Timothy and, and Luke were there. But, but there is now a group, not just of women, but it's also men. And so there's a church that is growing, and God has reached down and touched it, and, and, and it's this opportunity um, for them to really change the world. I, I love that, that there is grace and hope, and I love that we can believe that Jesus is the Son of God. And, and that's kind of where, um, where, where I want to kind of end tonight is this idea that, that God has plans that are big, big plans. And, and he, he has called us to places, as he called Paul and, 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 and Silas and Timothy and Luke and and as he opens those doors, uh, he also closes these doors. And as he closed this door for this town, he's opening it for the next town that he's going to go to and, and the next adventure, which we'll talk about next week. Um, God does the same with us. And as we're trusting him, as we're walking with him, he's not only going to open those those doors that are pleasant, but sometimes they're, they're painful. And for us to say, God, how, how are you going to work through this pain to get us to the, to the next step that you have for us? Because we know you have more. But how, how are you going to do that? We don't always get the how. We don't. I, I wish I could tell you that this is the first step and this is the second step. And this, but, but I'll tell you this, though. What Paul and Silas were doing in the prison was exactly what we need to be doing, which is continuing your praise, continuing your witness, continuing to let others see that even when bad things happen, even when we're struggling, God is faithful and he is able to help. Now, because of who they were and because of where they were and because of of how they were continuing to witness, look at what tremendous growth comes from that. And I wonder what would happen if uh, if the people here at, at, at Berkey, um, when we were going through struggles, when we personally go through struggles, if, if we were able to sing those hymns and continue to witness faithfully, what kind of impact would that have on the community around us, on the people that we work with, on the people that, that we see on a daily basis? How can we, in, in our relying on God and trusting him to walk beside us, how could that help us to be, uh, to change, to convict, to entice people to want to come to know Jesus better, to be part of this body of believers? Um, God has tremendous plans and it's a, it's a blessing to be part of it. And it's exciting to see what he's going to do next. But uh, we pray that, that, that it's not the painful variety. At the same time, though, we need to be prepared and willing to walk beside people that are struggling and say, man, you know what? God's got greatness through this. Stay strong. Keep holding on to that faith. Keep believing that God has more. Um, e even in the pain right now, you can trust God that he's going to walk beside you and help you through it. Um, help us to be the encouragement that our brothers and sisters might need uh, in that. And just um, and we thank you, God, that believing is, is what gets us in that relationship with you. Crazy but true. Uh, crazy but true. Dear God, I thank you for the ladies and gentlemen who joined us tonight. I ask God that you would help us uh, as we continue to go through rough spots in our own lives. Uh, help us, dear Lord, to be able to stay firm, to hold on to your truth, um, to be the blessing uh, that we need to be in spite of the pain. Um, you, you don't always take away the pain, dear Lord, but I ask God that you would be the encouragement that we need in the middle of it. Help us as well that are not going through pain to be an encouragement to those that are. Help us to find ways to help encourage and strengthen and, and build them up, that they might be able to bear up underneath the, the, the struggle that you are allowing in their life right now for the season that is now, knowing that you have a better plan and a bigger plan than even what we can see. Thank you, God, for your faithfulness. In your name we pray, amen.
that's all we have, folks. I hope you guys have a great night, and uh, we'll pick up next week in Acts chapter 17. There are more adventures and more churches and uh, more things to learn. So until next time.